Welcome to Learn at Home with VIA. My name is Michael Soskel, and I am an elementary science teacher at the Wall and Paul Beck Area School District. Thank you for joining me to play the Five Blue Challenge. Even though we have to stay home right now, it doesn't mean that we can't travel the world to learn about incredible places, amazing animals, new cultures, and interesting people. Each time we are together, I am going to take you on a virtual field trip to a new place so that we can learn together from the people who live there. But before we travel, you will have to guess where we're going. I'll give you five clues, and we'll see how quickly you can figure it out. Are you ready to explore with me? Do you want to know where we're going today? Let's play. Welcome back, everyone. I have a special trip planned for us today. But of course, before we travel, you're going to have to use the five clues that I give you to guess where we're going. So let's get started. Your first clue is that the country we're visiting today is on the equator. The equator runs right through the middle of this country. Now, if you remember last week's episode when we went to Ecuador, uh, that was the same. The Ecuador sits on the equator just like this country. But today we're traveling to a different country. So maybe take a look at a map and see if there's any other countries on the equator that, uh, that we might be visiting. And if you've got a pad and pencil, go ahead and write down your guess. Now, because this country is on the equator, it doesn't have seasons the same way that we do here in Pennsylvania. We go through spring, summer, winter, and fall uh, as the tilt of the earth, uh, as the axis of the earth uh, in the northern hemisphere points towards the sun during summer or away from the sun uh, during winter. But on the equator, sunlight pretty much hits directly um, all year round. And so when you talk to people in countries on the equator, they don't necessarily talk about the same seasons that we have. Usually, um, when I've traveled to the country that we're going to, to today, they've told me that their seasons are the rainy season and the dry season, so it's slightly different. The other thing that's really cool about being at the equator is that at different times of year, the amount of daylight doesn't change. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, here in Pennsylvania, during summertime, we get lots of daylight. Sometimes it stays light out until 9, 9.30 at night. But during the wintertime, the sun goes down really early at like 4.30. That doesn't happen at the equator. At the equator, there's 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of nighttime every day, all year long. Doesn't this sound like a cool place to visit? I can't wait to take you there in a couple minutes. Your second clue is all about sports. In the country that we're visiting today, they love to play sports. And two of their favorite sports are cricket and soccer. Now, if you've never seen a cricket match before, it's kind of like baseball. The bat is long and uh, about this wide, and it's flat. And instead of the ball coming over home plate the way we play baseball, the ball bounces before it comes to the batter. And the batter swings the flat bat and tries to hit the ball as far as he can. And there's fielders. And unlike the bases that we run when we play baseball or softball, um, there's two different uh, bases that the batter runs back and forth, carrying the bat with them. One time when I was in England, I got to play cricket. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but very different than baseball. Some similarities, but also very different in some ways. Uh, they also love to play soccer here, uh, like most countries in the world. Soccer is a very popular sport around the world. But in this country that we're traveling today, the sport that they are most successful at is not cricket or soccer. It's long-distance running. This country is famous for their long-distance runners. They've won marathons. They hold Olympic records. Can you think of any countries where long-distance running is something they're really good at? Write down a guess if you have one. Your third clue is that this country that we're visiting today is in Africa. So Africa is a huge continent. Sometimes we don't realize how big it is, but if you look at a map, you can see it's giant. It stretches all the way from South Africa, uh, down on the bottom, all the way up to the Northern African countries that, uh, that border the Mediterranean Sea on the top. So our country is somewhere in the middle because we of course know that our country is on the equator. So if you've got a map and you're looking at Africa, see if there's any countries on the equator that you might that we might be visiting today. Let's see if you have it. Your fourth clue is that the country we're visiting today has beautiful beaches and a coast on the Indian Ocean. Now, last week when we went to Ecuador, the, the coast there was on the Pacific Ocean. Today, we're visiting the Indian Ocean, so a different part of the world. Um, so take a look at your map of Africa if you have it. Um, let's show you a map here. And let's see those countries that are on the equator in Africa and border the Indian Ocean. Which one do you think we're going to? 
Okay, it's time for your fifth and final clue. The country that we're traveling to today is famous for its animals. As a matter of fact, people from all over the world travel to this country to go on safari. And that's what I'm going to do with you today. We're going to go on safari to see animals in six different national parks. Do you think you know what country we're going to? Write down your guess. If you guessed that we are going to Kenya today, you are correct. I have something really special planned today. Instead of just going to one place, we are going to visit six different national parks and we're going to take a boat ride to go look at some animals. Our first stop is going to be Lake Nakuru National Park, where we're going to learn from Caroline, who works for the Kenyan Wildlife Service. I'm here at Lake Nakuru National Park with Caroline, who is one of the education directors uh, for the Kenyan Wildlife Service here at the park. Um, and she's kindly agreed to talk a little bit about the animals and uh, some of the different ecosystems here in Kenya and in the park. So uh, thank you, Caroline, for taking some time with us. Thank you. So I guess my first question is, um, you know, here in Kenya, there's a lot of talk about the big five, right? So when people refer to the big five animals, what animals are they referring to? Oh, in Kenya, we are lucky to have the big five. We have the lions, the buffaloes, the rhinos, the elephants, and the leopard. Those are the big five. They are referred as the big five because a long time ago there was hunting in Kenya. And that time the hunters used to look for the big five because they were animals that were very hard to spot. They were very dangerous and they had valuable items like the ivory for the elephants. But hunting is no longer allowed uh, okay. in, of, of those animals in Kenya, right? It is not allowed. Yeah. So other than the big five animals, what other animals can we find here in Lake Nakuru National Park? In Lake Nakuru National Park, we have the big four. That is, we don't have the elephants here in, in Nakuru National Park because the ecosystem is quite small. An elephant needs a bigger uh, dispersal area. So in Lake Nakuru National Park, we have the big four. And, and also I've seen uh, baboons and monkeys and uh, uh, different um, uh, impala. Um, what, what other animals other than the, than the big four uh, can we find here? In Lake Nakuru National Park, we have 50 different mammals. We have the big four, as I mentioned. We have the water bugs. We have the gazelles, the Thompson gazelle. We have the, the grand gazelles. We have, the, we have so many other wildlife that you would like to see, including the dick dicks. We have the jackals, uh, a lot of gazelles, a lot of zebras, um, so, so much to see in the lake. Yeah. And I know uh, lions are the, are the big predators, right? You know, they're, they... Uh you know, they're at the top of the food chain here in the National Park. But what other predators uh, are there here in the park? We have the hyenas and we also have the leopards in the park. Mm -hmm. And we also have the jackals. All these are predators. Mm -hmm. So, Caroline, you, you were saying behind us right here is what used to be the main gate of uh, Lake Nakuru National Park. But now the main gate has been moved, uh, looks like a couple hundred yards, you know, up the hill uh, because the, the lake has grown uh, and gotten bigger. Um, is this due to climate change? We cannot entirely say it's because of the climate change that has caused the flooding of the lake. But there could be other factors other than that. Because uh, you realize that most of the Rift Valley lakes have uh, increased in size. But for Lake Nakuru National Park, it has been facing so many challenges. A few years ago, it had dried up. And um, the reason why it was drying up, it's because of the Mau Forest. The, there was a lot of deforestation of the Mau Forest. So that could be a reason why the, the lake had started drying up. But now with the rehabilitation of the Mau, we have experienced this flooding. Actually, we had to relocate locate our gates from here to the to the upper grounds and uh, another reason that could be causing the flooding of the lake is siltation there is a lot of cultivation that is happening along the riverbeds and especially the Nderit river which is one of the tributaries to the lake nakuru national park so uh, there's a lot of sensitization that we are doing we are holding community meetings to enlighten the community on the proper agricultural methods so that the, the rivers the, the rivers that we get in the lake they're not going to come with a lot of soil that is going to displace um, that is going to displace the water in the lake causing the flooding and we hope this is going to work so so uh, up up river a lot of people are doing their farming in the floodplain because that's where the good soil is but then what happens because of human activity uh, that soil then gets washed away down the river into the lake, which makes the lake rise. Yeah, that could be one of the major reasons why the river, the, the lake is flooding. And um, we are trying also to enlighten them on uh, how many meters they're supposed to cultivate along the, the river. They're not supposed to cultivate very close to the to, to the rivers. They're supposed to leave some grounds, uh, uh, an area we call the riparian areas. They're supposed to leave the riparian areas so that we can rehabilitate them together with African Wildlife Foundation and the Kenya Forest Service so that we'll not have a lot of soil uh, coming uh, into the lake. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I understand that there's some uh, problems with, uh, 
with different conservation and um, you know I know the lake is higher than it used to be. Can you talk about some of the reasons why conservation is so important to the national parks and to Lake Nakuru uh, specifically? Conservation is very important to us as Kenyans. One, because we are earning tourism revenue from there. There's a lot of foreign exchange that comes into Lake Nakuru National Park. In Kenya, uh, tourism is one of the of the of the key or most of the important uh, areas where we get revenue from, uh, followed by agriculture. So another thing that we are conserving, the reason why we are conserving is for posterity, for the future generations. Like for example, the rhinos that we have in Kenya, we don't have so many in the world. So we are conserving for posterity and also for education purposes. You realize that everyone comes to Lake Nakuru National Park for education trips. This is the best destination to come and learn more about wildlife that we have. And you were telling me before, as we were uh, driving down here to the lake, that more and more Kenyans are actually taking an interest in the in the parks and uh, con- conservation efforts. Yeah, we are really concentrating on marketing, marketing to the domestic tourists to encourage each and every Kenyan to come and visit the national park because we believe that when they learn the value of conservation, they're going to appreciate what we have. So uh, nowadays we have done a lot of campaigns, a lot of marketing to encourage citizens to come and visit the park. And actually, as you see in the previous uh, visitation that we've been having in the last holidays and the last years, we've been having most of, the, most, most of the tourists, most of the citizens coming to the park to come and see what we have. Long time ago, they thought visiting the national park parks is very expensive but now they're appreciating that visiting the national park is not very expensive and there's a lot to see there's a lot to learn in in the national parks so it seems like you have a pretty incredible job you know do do you enjoy what you do i enjoy what i do uh, because every day whatever i do is different it's not the same it's different when you go to the park what you saw yesterday is not exactly what you're going to see another day so it's something very enjoyable it's very enjoyable so I also understand there, there's lots of different national parks in Kenya other than Lake Nakuru, and some of them have very different environments and ecosystems than we have here. Can you, can you talk a little bit about some of the different uh, different areas in Kenya and, and different animals that may be in those parks? Yeah, we have terrestrial parks and you also have marine parks. Like when you go to the terrestrial park, like in Lake Nakuru National Park, you find a lot of terrestrial animals, like the big four I was talking about. But if you go to the marine parks, you find that we have a lot of fish, very many aquatic life are found in the, in the marine national parks. In Kenya, we have about 24 national parks that are manned by Kenya Wildlife Service, and we also have national reserves. These ones are under the management of the local county council. But the Kenya Wildlife Service has a supervisory role over the management of these uh, reserves. So even if they're not managed by Kenya Wildlife Service, we still have have an interest. We make sure that they are well managed, the animals are well taken care of, and we also do a lot of research for wildlife wherever they are found in the country, not only in the national parks. So, Carolyn, can you tell uh, the students all around the world that are going to be watching this video what they can do to help with conservation efforts here in the park? Yes. Yeah, there's a lot they can do to help us in conservation. In Lake Nakuru National Park, we have a very important uh, event that is Cycle with the Rhino. In Cycle with the Rhino, we normally have this activity every September. And the funds that we get from Cycle with the Rhino, they are used in rehabilitation of the fence. You realize that Lake Nakuru National Park is a breeding site for the rhinos. So these rhinos have to be protected. We have to have a very, a very intact fence to make sure that the poachers don't access the park. So the funds that we get from the Cycle with the Rhino, we normally take it to help the communities through community projects and part of that amount is taken to rehabilitation of the fence. So the students up there they can help us in fundraising for the event. It is normally in September and we encourage each and everyone to be part of this event because it is a noble event and the money that we get, we're going to get from there is accounted for and uh, we normally we normally use that money in conservation of uh, uh, conservation of our rhinos and that is by protecting the, the rhinos through erection of a, a, a fence. Right now we are putting up a a comprehensive fence that is going to keep away the poachers. You know, poaching has really been affecting Lake Nakuru National Park. It's one of the challenges that we are facing. So through cycle with the rhino funds, we are going to rehabilitate the fence and also help the communities. Well, Caroline, thank you for taking some time. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I know that our students all around the world, you know, very much appreciate the time that you took. Thank you so much. Lake Nakuru National Park is a really amazing place. I saw so many animals when I was there. The one animal that you can't find at Lake Nakuru, though, is the elephant because the park is too small. So next, we're going to travel to a national park that is famous for its elephants. We're going to go to Amboseli. In addition to lots and lots of elephants and other animals, Amboseli is great because you get amazing views of Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in all of Africa.
Springtime is a really special time to be on safari. At Ambicelli during the springtime, you can see lots of baby elephants. Before we leave Ambicelli, there's one more of my favorite animals that I want to show you. Take a look at these beautiful giraffes. Our next stop is Lake Nyavasha. In Lake Nyavasha, there's lots and lots of hippos. Take a look at this. Like most lakes, Lake Naivasha is also great for watching birds. You can see pelicans and even eagles that are fishing. There we go. Close by to Lake Naivasha, there are two other national parks that we're going to visit. The first is Hell's Gate National Park. This national park is special because you can actually go on a biking safari. You can take your bicycle and ride for a couple of miles through a dirt road that allows you to see animals along the way. Let's take a look. At the end of your bike ride, you come to the geographic feature that gives Hell's Gate National Park its name. Hell's Gate is a slot canyon that runs for a few miles. Over time, water in a creek caused erosion and cut deeper and deeper into a canyon. Slot canyons are very narrow and they can be very dangerous. In fact, Hell's Gate National Park is closed to hikers for large parts of the year during the rainy season because if there's a, a heavy rain, and you're in the slot canyon, there's no way for you to get out when the flooding happens. It can be very dangerous, and hikers have even died there. Our next stop is Mount Longanot National Park. Mount Longanot National Park is a little bit different than the others because it's an active volcano. It last erupted in about 1860. At Mount Longanot, you can hike about two miles up to the top of the volcano where you get to the caldera. A caldera is a crater that was caused by a volcanic eruption. When you're at the top, you can hike a four mile trail around the caldera looking down inside. And you can even see some geothermal vents where steam is coming out because the volcano is active. As you hike back down and you get down to the lower elevations, you can see zebra, giraffe, Thompson's gazelle, buffaloes, and hartebeest right near you as you're walking. There's nothing separating you from the animals. It's a really incredible experience.
Our second to last stop is Nairobi National Park. Nairobi National Park is the only place in the world where you can go on safari in the middle of a city. Nairobi is a big city and it's the capital of Kenya. But inside the city, they've put aside a special area of land that is just for animals. You can go on a driving safari and go see rhino and lions and other animals that you can see also in other national parks. But in addition, at Nairobi National Park, they have a safari walk where you can go through and see animals that are being rehabilitated because they've been hurt or sick in some way. I even got to meet a cheetah. So you can see the clothes. They have two powerful clothes instead of kicking forward and not backwards. And you can never kick a lion to death with the clothes. So the only pressure was the rumors. Yeah. Even the lions are also afraid of those two. I've saved my favorite Kenyan National Park and Reserve for last. The Maasai Mara is a spectacular place and it's famous around the world for its animals. In the Maasai Mara, you can see all of the big five. You can find lions, leopards, elephants, Cape buffalo, and rhinoceros. You can also see lots of other animals like hippos and giraffes and lots of different kinds of deer. But perhaps the Maasai Mara is most famous for the wildebeest migration, the great migration. Every year, more than one and a half million wildebeest move from the Serengeti down in Tanzania and up across the Mara River into Kenya, into the Maasai Mara. As they cross the river, there's lots of hungry crocodiles that are waiting for them. You can imagine that not all of the wildebeest make it. In fact, on their journey, almost 250,000 wildebeest die every year. During well, we've covered a lot of ground today and we've seen a lot of different animals in a whole lot of different Kenyan national parks. Thanks for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed today's trip as much as I did. Traveling is one of my favorite ways to learn. Already, I can't wait for our next adventure. Thank you for joining me at Learn at Home with VIA and for sharing this experience with me. Keep exploring. I'll see you again soon.